Hey, witches. Today's episode is about eugenics, and in it, we talk about real examples of Canada's genocidal treatment of Indigenous peoples. If this conversation could be triggering for you, feel free to skip it. Take care of yourselves. Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Hannah McGregor. And I'm Marcel Cosman. You know, Hannah, Hmm. I was thinking that the best way to get ourselves into the right headspace for today's episode might be to talk about our favorite breeds of dog. So, (laughs) why don't you tell me everything you look for in a good boy in the sorting chat? Marcel, opening an episode on eugenics with a conversation about dog breeds is so dark. I mean, it's going to come up again. Yeah, and it's apt. Okay, so my hottest of hot takes is that I think that breeding dogs is really gross. I think that breeding animals is really gross. I'm Um, shocked by this. You're a vegan. I know, it's so so at odds with all of my normal (laughs) politics. I really don't like when people buy designer Mm, dogs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. though usually i think that um the punishment ends up just being the fact that you then have a (laughs) pretty bad dog (laughs) like every everybody (laughs) everybody getting one of these current trendy poodle and something else crosses which are like you know they're big trend dogs this exact thing is going to come up in like 45 minutes (laughs) and it's it's really funny because cross anything with a poodle and you get a version of that dog that is now also like evil. <laughs> like, poodles, poodles are super smart and spend like the first four lo- years of their lives being completely uncontrollable. And so I love watching all of these people who got themselves like a designer burn a doodle and now have a dog that they're like, what do I do with this? <laughs> it's learned how to open doors like the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. Anyway, so I think that animals should come from the dump. Mm-hmm. Um, that's mm-hmm. my that's, that's my take. pet politics. <laughs> However, that said, obviously, I love all kinds of mm-hmm. breeds. I particularly love a small, thick terrier or bulldog. Oh, I f- love English bulldogs so much. I love a dog that is the same width the whole way. <laughs> Like it's a just a sphere. It's just a sphere with yeah. Me. Like I just, I just want it. I'm making this hand gesture. <laughs> that is what I do when I've got my hands on a thick old yeah. terrier. I just want to grab my little grum. And then my other favorite kind of dog is the sort of extreme opposite, which is like I, I love like a deer hound. Oh, like a pointy dog. Like a pointy, an enormous pointy yeah. dog. Like a truly huge dog that just looks like it came from the mist. So you love both dogs that are like fully, when they're three-dimensional, I mean, most dogs are (laughs) three-dimensional. Most, yeah. In my experience. You love dogs that are perfect spheres and dogs that are two-dimensional is, I guess, what I'm trying to say, right? Like those pointy dogs, you turn them to the side and you don't see them anymore. (laughs) Yeah, they disappear. They disappear. And my ideal is that I want... One of each of them, and then I want them to be friends. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Marcel, tell me about your favorite, your favorite dog. It's so weird to simultaneously be like, no, dog breeding is fucked up. And also, I love these dogs. (laughs) We know that it's possible to love something and critique it at the same time, Marcel. I know, I know. But it's also like, I love them, but I don't want them to exist. You know, like it's weird. It's a weird place to be, which is why I really love like animal shelters that specialize in specific breeds, because that's where you go to get the kind of breed that you have some weird affinity for so that you can like absolve yourself of any kind of responsibility for the eugenic breeding of dogs. (laughs) Anyway, I have a real a real love for wrinkly dogs, like the dogs that just look like they're melting. Oh, Bulldogs, yeah. basset hounds. They always look so sad. And I guess similarly, dogs that will just decide to stop walking. You know, they're just like, I'm done now. And they just want to take a nap. And you're like five minutes into your walk. I just really respect that. I was in the park with friend of the pod, Ashra, 
this past weekend and she was saying that there somebody needs to make a like compilation video of dogs that decide that they are done with their walk <laughs> yeah and just like lie down mm-hmm. and are like I'm done, so you can solve this now, but I will be walking no further. Maybe that does exist. Somebody send it to us. Please do. Please do. Let us know. Marcel, do you remember that time that you and I were eating vegan brunch in Victoria and there was this tiny, perfect, unbelievable dog and both of us, both of us momentarily lost our fucking um, minds, threw our politics out the window and we're like, well, I guess we are both going to purchase (laughs) miniature Australian sheepdogs because... This is the perfectest puppy I have ever seen, and I want a hundred of them. I can't even remember if I asked permission to take photos of the dog or if I just surreptitiously took photos of the dog. Of course you did. You always ask for consent. Okay, because all I know is that I sent pictures of this dog to Trevor and was like, this, I want this. And he was like, no. (laughs) Get me one. Get me one of these. Immediately. Bring me a dog. (laughs) That's the voice I use when I Trevor, fetch my house. When I purchase purebred dogs. Trevor! <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, this episode's going to be unhinged. Let's go! Sometimes looking at the past means coming face to face with some pretty despicable things that you did and said. Fortunately, this process also keeps us accountable and ensures we're able to keep learning. So let's do just that in revision. Marcel, are you suggesting that we have said and done despicable things in past episodes? I would never admit to a mistake. I just want our listeners to be prepared for the absolute shocker that cis white women like us have been and often still are complicit in some pretty horrific politics, even when they slash we claim to be feminists. (gasps) So we should definitely start this segment by looking at what we've had to say about feminism and its constant need for intervention. Absolutely. So when we first introduced feminist literary criticism back in 2020, we opted to center the voices of Black feminist writers and scholars like Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks. We did this because in spaces dominated by white voices, like universities and politics, Black women's concerns especially tend to get treated as fringe or secondary to a non-existent neutral feminism that is imagined to be unaffected by race. In other words, white women have conversations about women's issues when what we actually mean is white women's issues. So it was important to us that we preempt that kind of thinking by introducing feminist literary criticism intersectionally. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually first talked about intersectionality in our episode on class when we quoted from Kianga Yamata Taylor, who explains the inherent relationship between class and race in a capitalist society. And then in book four, episode three, we were joined by guest Kay Alex to talk about critical race theory in detail. She walked us through the fandom's reading of Hermione as Black and how that reading makes visible all kinds of structural inequities in both the wizard and muggle worlds. Kay Alex also drew our attention to the ways that J.K. Rowling was able to capitalize off how fandoms read Hermione without actually doing the work of making the character canonically Black. Speaking of J.K. Rowling being a shitty white feminist... It will also be helpful to remember that in our introduction to queer theory, we introduced the concept of heteronormativity. So Hannah, you quoted from Lauren Berlant and Michael Warner, who describe heteronormativity as, quote, the institutions, structures of understanding, and practical orientations that make heterosexuality seem not only coherent, that is, organized as a sexuality, but also privileged, end quote. And one way to think about privileging heterosexuality is looking at the ways institutions are organized around presumed heterosexuality. So 
deviations from heterosexuality become not only unthinkable, but are made to seem wholly unnatural and even dangerous. That's right. We had similar conversations about disability, neurodivergence, and trauma in our episodes with Jess Battis, Taya Garbeza, Lucia Lorenzi, and Addie Marians. In fact, in our very first foray into disability studies with Jess Battis, you, Hannah, used the phrase light eugenics to describe the wizarding world's obsession with blood status. Mm. So as we're getting into the history of eugenics as a way to understand Voldemort's fascism, we need to remember that like queerness and like race, neurodivergence and disability have been treated as other and therefore as something needing to be socially controlled and managed. Hey, Marcel, speaking of social control and management, Mm -hmm. are we going to need to talk about our episode about the nation state? Uh, I think this is all we have time for, but I'm glad you brought it up. Well, it was in the script. So what do nationalism, racism, ableism, and heteronormativity have to do with eugenics, you may ask? I will. Hey, Marcel, what do nationalism, racism, ableism, and heteronormativity have to do with eugenics? I'm so glad you asked, Hannah. Let's find out in our next segment. If there's one thing white feminism does, it's take a shitty lady who did one good thing and transfigure her into a hero to hide all the other harmful things she does. And no, we're not talking about J.K. Rowling. It's transfiguration class. For today's deep dive into eugenics, I'm drawing on a couple of different sources, but the main one is actually a book written by my PhD supervisor, Cecily Devereaux, and it's called Growing a Race, Nellie McClung and the Fiction of Eugenic Feminism. Nellie McClung, a great example of a historical figure who we celebrate for one good thing, even though she super sucks, (laughs) right up there with Tommy Douglas, which is a Canadian reference that only Canadians are going to get. Probably not even most of them. He came up with socialized medicine. (laughs) He was like, he was the socialized medicine guy. Shockingly, a eugenic principle. Anyway, we'll get to that. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. I was worried, but I'm comforted. I'm glad that me yelling at you not to worry comforts you. (laughs) It's one of my love languages. (laughs) So, Marcel, what's What's eugenics? Eugenics is one of those 19th century pseudosciences that justified a lot of racist, ableist, and generally violent, oppressive behaviors. So it is not unrelated to phrenology. Okay, so the basic principles of eugenics are as follows. The term comes from a 19th century British scientist named Francis Galton. He used he used the term to refer to his science of selective breeding or what he called judicious mating. So now you see why I wanted to start by talking about dog breeds, okay? Yes. Yes. So to quote Cecily, quote, the basis of eugenics was genetic, the idea that many characteristics or tendencies, not only physical characteristics, but perceived inclinations towards, for instance, alcoholism, tuberculosis, or insanity, are hereditary. Mm. The logic of selective breeding suggests that if bad characteristics could be blocked and good ones fostered, the quality of a nation's people or its race could be improved, made individually and collectively stronger and healthier, and thus the nation itself would be made more powerful. End quote. Okay, so nationalism, it was worth noting in revision. Nationalism plays a major role in the popularity of eugenics. So in Canada, eugenics was fundamentally intertwined with the aims of the expanding British Empire. Okay, so the the colonization of Turtle Island by Anglo-Saxons was understood as a project to extend the reach and power of Great Britain. Even after Confederation, when Britain recognized Canada as a sovereign state, Canadian social reform movements were generally figured as in service to the British Empire. So, I mean, not surprised to find that there is a connection between, like, eugenics and and colonization, Mm -hmm. which I'm... Sure, we will talk about more. But 
I want to ask here about nationalism and science, because I feel like right now when we think about conservative, neo-fascist, nationalist movements that are on the Mm -hmm. rise, they tend to actually be quite anti-science. Yes. Yes, they do. So we want to keep in mind that Galton was developing this so-called science of selective breeding during a period in the 19th century that emphasized ethnicity and language as the general criteria for nationhood. So he's writing at a time when people are actively using these so-called sciences to defend the idea of an ethnic or language-based nationalism. Gotcha. So it's not really about being anti-science so much as it is about being pro-whatever tools help you push forward a sort of white supremacist agenda. Yeah. So not anti-science, not pro-science, but pro-white supremacy, I think, is a pretty loosey-goosey way to describe it. I think we can kind of see that now with the with the resurgence of some of these pseudosciences. Totally. So I'm going to quote from Cecily again here because she argues that, quote, underpinning Galtonian eugenics was an impulse to refine and strengthen a nation conceived in these terms as an identifiable racial community whose preservation was necessary to the protection of a particular geopolitical space, end quote. So if we think about this new Canadian nationalism that was emerging during this period, eugenics was as much about building a new so-called race called Canadians as it was about building strong, hardy workers who would settle and colonize and defend this colonized land from so-called enemies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this makes a lot of sense, the sort of collapsing of nationality and race, that like those two things become synonymous Mm -hmm. in a way that then you know, has impact on immigration policies. Mm, We'll get to that. Amongst other things. So walk me through what, like, a social policy for selective breeding actually looks like. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to stress that what we're describing now as efforts towards eliminating specific traits, that, that, that these efforts were very literal and can actually be kind of mapped out by looking at the histories of state-run institutions. So one example I think that is becoming increasingly apparent to Canadians and to people paying attention to news stories about this is uh, the way that residential schools in Canada were part of a system of genocide and not any sincere effort at assimilation, right? So like The claim that Canadian lawmakers ever had good intentions with residential schools is unsupportable if we actually look at how they functioned and what they did. Yeah, like the mortality rate of children who attended those schools was staggering. Yeah, exactly. And if we look at the rates of incarceration and institutionalization of residential school survivors, we can see that eugenic policies actually operate as a vast network, right? Mm. So, for example, the province of Alberta passed what was called a sexual sterilization bill in 1928. And this I'm taking out of Cecily's book again. It, quote, empowered a board of four members to inhibit, through surgical sterilization, the power of procreation for anyone residing in a provincial institution deemed a mentally defective person, end quote. So a panel of four people would be able to decide that anybody who was institutionalized in any state-run institution should be sterilized. I think it can be tempting to sort of look back and say like, oh, well, that was a really terrible period in our history, but we don't do that anymore. But we know that's not the case. Right. So like we know that throughout the 20th century, indigenous people in state run institutions account for a hugely disproportionate percentage of people who were forcibly sterilized. But then when we had our guest Mercedes Eng on with us to talk about these continued disproportionate rates of incarceration among Indigenous folks, and specifically Indigenous women, she was able to provide contemporary examples of how this is exactly a policy that continues. Yeah, and that that the the disproportionate 
incarceration of indigenous women is a eugenicist practice insofar as it is a response by the state to the fact that like indigenous youth are the fastest growing population in Canada. Exactly, exactly. So these policies, whether they were explicitly eugenic or not, because the language changed over time. They did, in their origins, a lot of these policies were like, this is for eugenics, thumbs up. That language becomes less popular, but we can tell that the policies stay really similar. Mm -hmm. So the language shifts, but the practices don't always. Exactly. And these were intentional and systemic and broad sweeping efforts to define Canada as a white Anglo-Saxon and Protestant country. And, you know, like you're saying, Hannah, that the language shifts. And as a result of that, a lot of the social policies that are in place today, which we might even be fans of, like socialized health care, like we talked about earlier, these come from eugenic principles. So mm. another another example is the current laws around the regulation and control of alcohol and drugs. These come from eugenic practices and eugenic principles because eugenic feminists like Emily Murphy, a very good friend of Nellie McClung's, described these things as, and I quote, racial poisons, end quote, because they apparently or allegedly slowed the birth rate of hardworking white people by making their users impotent. Oh, my God. I want to talk more about drug policy, but should we pause and tell our non-Canadians who Emily Murphy and Nellie McClung are, or are we going to get to that? Okay, because probably a lot of people are like, I don't know who those bitches are. So Emily Murphy and Nellie McClung are two of what we refer to as the famous five, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who were five white ladies. Five white ladies. In the early... 1900s? The early 1900s, 20th century, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Aren't they the ones who advocated for women to be legally defined as persons in Canada so that they could, like, hold office and That's stuff? right, so that they could hold office, so that they could vote. But, and this is the part that activists and intersectional feminists will point out, the part that gets left out of that advocacy of the Famous Five is that they were specifically talking about white women. Oh, and very specifically talking about white women. And they tend to be celebrated as these like major feminist figures in Canadian history. But when you when you like scratch the surface of their politics, mm -hmm. it's not we're talking about white women because we aren't thinking about women of mm -hmm. color. It's we are talking about white women because we believe that the legal recognition of white women is part of furthering the white supremacist goals of this nation. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get back briefly to the criminalization of drug use, which I actually feel like continues to be a kind of cause that is strongly associated with like white women who believe that they are bettering mm. their society, this sort of patronizing, caretaking white lady politics mm -hmm. often aligns with this idea of like, we need to take care of drug users. And by take care of, we mean like, not treat them like humans with agency and autonomy, but like, put them somewhere else where you can't see them. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, the, the criminalization of drug use is eugenic because we have plenty of studies that show us that harm reduction, safe supply, safe drug use sites, it saves lives. However, it remains incredibly difficult to get safe consumption sites approved. So saving lives is clearly not the goal here. Mm -hmm, that's right. And it never has been. So the the anxieties about drugs and alcohol, as Cecily puts it in her book, were never about the, quote, individual well-being of members of a national community, end quote. They were policies responding to anxiety related to the slowing biological reproduction of white people at a time of increasing immigration, particularly the immigration of non-white people. It's such a bummer how 
totally fucking contemporary this conversation feels like listening to people just unabashedly talk about like quote unquote replacement rates and the like social crisis of white people not having enough children it's just like fucking 100 year old vintage eugenics yeah but like you said earlier with new words so we don't with new we words. don't recognize it as eugenics because eugenics is a dirty word. We know it's bad. So we instead call it other things like, I don't know, old stock Canadians. Sorry, that's another that's another inside reference. That was a conservative dog whistle in Canada. Old stock Canadians. OK, so this is interesting because at the same period of time, like the early 20th century was a period of Canada actively recruiting a lot of immigrants to colonize the country as part of the project of pushing indigenous people out of Mm -hmm. their traditional territory. So the regulation and control of so-called racial poisons is one response to the need to sort of breed this Canadian Mm -hmm. race. How else does eugenics respond to immigration? So this is where I want to come back to dog breeding, because the logic of eugenics, in my humble opinion, is best exemplified if we look at dog breeding, okay? It is quite an unabashed version of it. Oh, yeah. You can really see the logic at work in how dog breeding works. Totally. And because it's animals, we're like, yeah, okay, sure, because it's not people. But we have a whole episode about animal studies that we probably should have brought up in revision, but, you know... Listen, it's com- this is a complex topic. It obviously intersects with a lot of our other conversations. Shockingly. Okay, so eugenics takes the position that there are different races of human in the same way that there are different breeds of dog, okay? And if we look at dog breeding, we can see that the objective isn't no mixing between breeds ever, The objective is deliberate and controlled mixing to enhance specific characteristics. So, Labradoodles, some guy, some ding-dong, puts a poodle and a lab together in the backyard and makes a Labradoodle. And now the Labradoodle is so popular that all these other kinds of doodle, like the Bernadoodle, follow suit. So, pop quiz, Hannah. What are the qualities of a Labradoodle that make it such a popular breed? I can only think of one because evil isn't, (laughs) is not on my list. (laughs) Okay, my understanding is actually that the idea is that the poodle makes the dog hypoallergenic because poodles are hypoallergenic dogs. And so they're trying to take other dogs that don't have the personalities of poodles that have to try to find dogs with better personalities and then cross them with with poodles having having coats that are not that are not as fur they don't shed as much and so they can be easier for people with allergies but like that's also not how breeding works so you end up with yeah bernadoodle with the coat of a bernie's mountain dog and the personality of a poodle yeah yeah you just end up with an evil dog and you're still allergic to it you know like it's (laughs) <laughs> it's complicated stuff. So you got to you you've got to keep in mind that these same attitudes were unironically held by people, unironically and consciously held by people, okay? It's we're not talking like a subconscious internalized racism or xenophobia. We're we're talking like British people truly believed that British people were superior and that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants possessed superior genes and that those genes made them morally good, hardworking, and even immune to so-called defects like homosexuality and alcoholism. Okay, Marcel, (laughs) but I know for a fact that there are some homosexual white people. (laughs) Explain that. (laughs) Yeah. Not only some homosexual white people, but also some alcoholic Britons. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Also a legitimate legitimate point. (laughs) Okay. So, like, unsurprisingly, like all human beings, some Brits are hardworking and some are not. And so... Some poodles are nice and some are mean. Exactly. Some poodles are good and some poodles are evil, you know? Because this isn't actually how anything works. So while there was absolutely a class factor in terms of which Brits were considered hardy and like strong enough to do homesteading because the upper classes were too delicate and they couldn't, it became necessary to encourage hardworking 
Canadians to mix with other desirable, hardy races. Okay, so desirable, scare quotes, races, scare quotes, scare quotes around everything. Mm. Okay, so Mm -hmm. the Swedes and the Dutch, like Nordic Europeans, were, were considered very beneficial to the Canadian race because of their capacity to work hard in cold conditions. Okay, so speaking of meaning these things literally, there's this book oh, yeah. mm-hmm. that I have used very frequently in my own teaching and writing <laughs> um, that I know you have also used frequently in your own teaching and writing because it is quite a remarkable historical artifact, mm-hmm. which is a guidebook on the desirability of different immigrants in Canada. That's right. And as other friend of the podcast and friend of us, Professor Julie Rack, told me, it was progressive. It was considered a progressive text. So the book, it's it's by this this guy who was, I think he was um like a minister, like a progressive minister. Sounds plausible. His name is J.S. Woodsworth. He wrote this book called Strangers Within Our Gates or Coming Canadians. And he was absolutely a progressive who thought that this was, like, helpful to discourage the immigration of people who could not thrive in Canada. It's a very paternalistic attitude of saying, like, I'm actually just doing this for your own good. You actually wouldn't be happy in Canada. It's very cold here and only good for white people. Mm -hmm. You don't have the genetic makeup to till the land said to people who have been f- like farming and cultivating farming land for many many <laughs> generations yeah. yeah 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 okay so so what was woodsworth's you know fucking hierarchy of who should come to okay Canada? so it won't surprise you that the cream of the crop <laughs> <laughs> let me guess let me guess it was british, it was people, british people it was british people it was 100 percent british people yeah I think Americans are up there, too. Yeah. He was like, listen, if they want to come, they're welcome. You're not wrong about that, because his book is also very anxious about the fact that America had stopped being American because of the number of undesirable immigrants who had gotten there. So the top three categories of people are really the only ones who I, who I want to raise because everybody else was increasingly unwelcome. And there are some terms that I just don't feel like it's appropriate to say on a podcast. So I'm, I'm not going to name the rest of them. Yeah, we can actually skip over how he felt about, like, Jewish people and Black people, maybe. Yeah. So he recommended Brits, Scandinavians, including Icelandics, it's in parentheses. Mm. And he recommended Germans, particularly Mennonites. I write about this, the fact that my family came over as part of these eugenicist immigration policies in my book, A Sentimental Education. Out now. I'm going to have to get a copy of that from my local library. Mm, you, should look, you should look it up. So I mentioned, I mentioned that Woodsworth has a chapter about the problem with immigration. And in it... He describes Canada and the U.S. as, quote, the old world's dumping ground, end quote. Okay, (laughs) and he he gives he gives the example. okay, because you know what? Early 20th century writers loved sentimental examples. Okay, so he uses the example. He describes Canada as follows. Okay. Quote, fancy a mother with her own baby to care for, adopting half a dozen other babies, some of them, too, of very uncertain tempers, end quote. Ooh, yeah. A ma- what a bad mother. What a bad mother. <laughs> that would be to take care of many children. So, like, we know that there are oodles of problems with American immigration policy. But I think it's worth noting that Woodsworth is writing at this period when people are flocking to America because the whole Statue of Liberty, give us your tired, you're weak, you're hungry, you're 
And Canada's like, actually, sorry, no, thank you. If you are tired, weak, or hungry, you are not vigorous enough for our cold, hardy yeah. country. We would actually only like the well rested, the strong, <laughs> and the amply fed. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, other other examples of things that, quote unquote, progressive Canadians said in and around this period, you know, like Vincent Massey, I know this is a few decades later, but he referred to there being a problem in Canada of people with Old Testament last names, you know, like, whoa, <laughs> the active white supremacist nation building agendas of progressive Canadians is so virulently racist when you actually look at the things that they said and did that, um, I, you know, I just, Canada really has a reputation for being the good one. And it's not. It's not. Sorry, folks. We have a slightly better political system. That's literally all we've got. We've got a slightly better political system. We got that socialized health care, but as you pointed out, that itself comes from eugenic histories. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that's really crucial here is that rather than looking at Canada and the U.S. and seeing, you know, the U.S. as a country with more diversity, but also a country with more problems like racial violence, mm -hmm. and, you know, Canada as a country, we're like, we don't have a race problem, mm -hmm. which is often the sort of perspective from outside. You have to look at these different immigration policies, which is that the U.S. often had a more lenient set of immigration policies that were then paired with internal laws about managing mm -hmm. racialized populations. The creation of ghettos, obviously, you know, enslaved laborers, lots of sort of histories of bringing in labor, but then policing those populations. Whereas with a small number of exceptions, for example, bringing in Chinese workers to build the railroad, mm -hmm. Canada just had significantly more prohibitive immigration policies. Like, why do we not have as publicized a problem of anti-Black violence in Canada? Mm -hmm. Well, a big part of it is because there's a significantly smaller Black population in Canada, and that is because the U.S.'s response to anti-Black racism was enslavement, Canada's was expulsion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're two sides of the same coin. They're not like, here's the good country and here's the bad country. You know, Hannah, you reminded me bringing in Chinese workers to work on the railroad also came with it a lot of, obviously, a lot of anxieties about miscegenation. And so a lot of anxieties about white women marrying Chinese men and women who were white women who were in relationships with Chinese men were frequently institutionalized by their families because families had the capacity during this period to have their daughters institutionalized. So when we're thinking about the ways in which eugenics manages and controls the quote-unquote mixing of quote-unquote races, we're really talking about people putting their children in institutions to prevent them from being in relationships with non-white people. Yeah. And we are also talking about, you know, this kind of deliberate, quote unquote, breeding of stronger workers, right? So it's, it's I think it's really helpful to remember, and this is going to, this is going to come up, I think, when we talk about about this oh, book. Oh, I forgot about the this book. This Harry Potter book <laughs> that we're going to talk about. Mm, I forgot about the book. Yeah, because this is a Canadian history podcast, obviously, what both of us secretly long for it to be. But the idea of, oh, we must maintain blood purity by keeping undesirables out, and the idea that, oh, actually, we will strengthen the bloodline by bringing in new blood mm -hmm that, you know, produces hybrid vigor, those are both eugenics. Mm -hmm. It's a debate about the best way to do eugenics, but it's both eugenics. It's both treating humans as breedable and race as genetic and controllable categories. Yeah, like a, a set of traits that determine what kind of person you will be. 
All right, well, this is all a bummer. Let's go talk about Harry Potter for a while. That sounds great. You know, some might say birds of a feather flock together, but we say don't bring birds into your xenophobic nonsense. It's time for owls. Whew. Wizarding World chock block full of you, Oh, yeah. Like it's the one of the structuring yep. logics of the Wizarding World. And we find that out fairly quickly because people talk about being pure blood, half blood, and either muggle born mm -hmm. or mud blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the language of blood here is explicitly eugenicist language. So we learn those things in the first book. And then in the second book, we learn about squibs, right? Which are the the, the wizarding world's version of muggle borns, like the the flip side, I guess. Yeah, non magical mm -hmm. people born to wizarding families but who don't have magic. So on the one hand, we're definitely encouraged to see the focus on blood status as problematic. That's something that the books want us to think. Yes, that is a that's a bad thing that the bad guys think. And yet, and yet, structurally, the the series and this book in particular remain obsessed with the idea of genetics as something that you can manage. We've got to talk about the like revelation about Harry's ancestry that he's descended from the one of the the, the Peverell Peveril brothers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, on the one hand, we've got the like almost straw man explicit eugenicist language that Voldemort uses. Yes. That's what the book is pointing to as here is the bad guy version of eugenics. Mm -hmm. There's that scene really early on in the book where we see Voldemort and his followers in Malfoy Manor. And he's talking specifically to Bellatrix about, you know, the fact that she comes from this very proud, pure blood family, but that some of her family members, and I think Voldemort's talking about Tonks specifically, because Tonks is with a werewolf, and that is so unacceptable. And he says, many of our oldest family trees become a little diseased over time. You must prune yours, must you not, to keep it healthy? Cut away those parts that threaten the health of the rest. It's the same logic, though, right? It's like it's about sort of this idea that, like, you must manage mm -hmm. the breed mm -hmm. um, through this kind of, you know, selective breeding selective splicing a kind of like biological management right. and then he's he he continues to say that like as in your family so in the world we shall cut away the canker that infects us until only those of the true blood remain so canker. voldemort is for sure saying the quiet part out loud yeah right he's like let's make a list of the undesirables we will find them we will incarcerate them. We will, you know, use the institutions we have access to to round them up and eliminate them. And yet, arguably, Voldemort is a product of a wizarding culture that is structurally obsessed with genetics and inheritance at every level, rather than being an aberration from a culture that otherwise doesn't care about blood status. Right. Like, he didn't invent the idea of wizarding eugenics. He's capitalizing on it and building his power by speaking to people who feel that way. He's not introducing the concept. Yeah. So look at, for example, wand control. Mm -hmm. One of the really villainous things happening in the ministry under Voldemort's rule is that muggle-born wizards and witches are being brought in, they're being questioned, and then based on this kind of like circular logic of, well, muggle-borns can't be magical, and so if you are muggle-born and are magical, you must have, or, and have a wand, you must have stolen mm -hmm. it. You know, they're questioning them and they're they're taking their wands mm -hmm. away. 
that's like you know like obviously a terrifying expression of the the fascism of the wizarding world under Voldemort and yet it was already the job of wizarding institutions to select who was adequately magical and give only those people wands and access to magic, right? We get Neville in the first book saying that, like, they thought he might be a squib. Like, if you're a squib, you don't get invited to Hogwarts. And if you don't get invited to Hogwarts, you don't get a wand. That's right. And then we also get the explicit revelation that wizards keep wand magic away from other magical creatures like like goblins. Mm-hmm. So that's literally the whole logic of we are selecting who gets access to magic and who doesn't already is how the whole system works. And even the people who are not explicitly eugenicist are using language in a way that justifies that practice, right? So if we think back to what Ollivander says and what comes back in this book, the wand chooses the wizard, that Mm. would suggest that if the wand isn't choosing you, then you don't get one, right? And so it's just, so it's just implicit. That there's something inherent in you. Yeah, that the wand would choose you if you deserved it. And so this is what we hear from, and I, I'm so sorry if I'm confusing the movie with the book, but Mary Cattermole, who's like, the wand, it, the, I, it was mine. I got it when I went to Ollivander's and the wand chose me. We see her being questioned and she's like, no, I got like, I, you know, yeah. I got it when I was when I was 11 and, and went to Diagon Alley and visited Ollivander. And it, it deliberately evokes the first book and Harry's sort of experience of going to Ollivander so that we'll feel like it's an injustice That's right. and doesn't evoke any of the squibs yeah. who didn't get to have that experience yeah. and doesn't evoke like Petunia Dursley being told that here's this special thing that your sister gets access to and you're not allowed to have it because you're not special. That's like, right. There is an, a logic still of selectivity. Yeah, yeah. And so if we think about selectivity, if we use that as our keyword, for example, and then we sort of build from that to think about the way in which we see squibs, for example, being treated in the wizarding world, like, at least not, not that I can think of, we don't have any examples of squibs who have children with witches or wizards. That's so interesting. The squibs that we see in the book are all childless. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that's so grim. Yeah, selective breeding. I can watch Coach getting bummed out in real time. (laughs) I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, like, the series seems to suggest that there are good eugenics and bad eugenics. That, like, bad eugenics is, well, if you keep marrying your cousins, you're going to end up with Malfoy. And we all agree that Malfoy sucks. But good eugenics is when Ron and Hermione get together and they have children because that's introducing good quality new wizard stock, new wizard stock instead of old wizard stock. You know, the the flip side of the sort of like white liberal progressive version of eugenics which is about like kind of a selective interbreeding of people in order to produce virility and and vigor as opposed to like old world conservative aristocratic notion of like inbreeding that makes you weak and pale. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm I talking do. about? Like we see this in a lot of British literature and it's the logic of the gaunts, right? That they are you know they're they're this family that's overly obsessed with blood purity and the examples of the gaunts that we see are like very clearly being coded to us as inbred mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then what produces this remarkably powerful wizard remarkably powerful but still with that strain of evil it was in the bloodline absolutely and then the other side of in the bloodline that we get is are revelations about Harry and his deep roots in Godric's Hollow, which is, you know, one of the big revelations of this book that I continue to find narratively so... Unnecessary? Lazy? Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it just feels like 
sorry, this didn't come up in any of the previous books. Like, there's no, there's no foreshadowing. Mm-mm. There's no planting of any seeds. There's no, it's just like, anyway, Godric's hollow. Let's yeah. go. And so this revelation, right, that he's, that builds on what Hagrid said to Harry in the first book, which is that he was probably going to be a strong wizard because both of his parents were. That's right. A thumping good one is what Hagrid says. And then we get this like, oh, it's not just that both of his parents were, though, you know, he is also to some degree a product of that same kind of of logic of like, you know, an old family crossed with a new family produces particularly good because wizards. Because Lily is Muggleborn, of course, of course. Because Lily is Muggleborn, but James comes from a very long history that goes all the way back to the to the Peveril brothers. And this just occurred to me as you were describing it, the heirloom that's passed down is the invisibility cloak. So it's not even just that he's one of the three Peverils. He was the good one. Yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Dumbledore specifically says that he's that he comes from the youngest brother, who we know lived the longest because he was the best. Yeah. Yeah. He's the one that had the children. The other two died because they were bad. Yeah. All of this is really this like I was going to ask this in the last segment of like how much of this is is the misapplication of Darwin that as soon as people understand how evolution works and how like evolution selects for particular mm-hmm. traits it so quickly becomes people being like oh evolution does it I'll do it better I'll do it harder <laughs> I will select I will select for traits and, you know, evolution is not saying that it's better to be this kind of turtle than to be that kind of turtle. It's just like explaining why there are more of this kind of turtle. But people so quickly turn it into a hierarchy, right? Survival of the fittest, which is like absolutely not what Darwin's talking about. I don't think that evolution is forward thinking. Evolution is responsive, It's descriptive. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. And people very quickly tried to turn it into prescriptive. And that, you know, I think we see that in, you know, survival of the fittest, the best of the Peveril brothers, the smartest of the Peveril Mm -hmm. brothers got to go on and have children. And those children became smart, good wizards like Harry. Potters. So this book in particular, but the series as a whole, that becomes just such a perfect encapsulation of the way that a white liberal perspective points at explicit eugenics Mm -hmm. often as a way to distance themselves from the tacit eugenics that they're engaged with, usually through the organization of institutions. And that they benefit from. And that they benefit, that they're actively benefiting Mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. That is why, right, we see that Voldemort is a logical outcome of a deeply eugenicist wizarding world. Mm -hmm. And at the end, despite all of the flaws that we have seen in the logics of the wizarding world, it returns to the same. It returns to a handful of special children going off to their special school you know, wondering whether they're going to turn out to be good or turn out to be bad. Even the logic that, like, you're genetically a Slytherin or a Gryffindor Mm -hmm. or a Hufflepuff, Mm -hmm. right? Like, the anxiety we see in that epilogue over the, like, the possibility that you will be the bad son because you will not have inherited the desirable traits from your famous father. You're not brave. (laughs) You're not genetically brave. You're not genetically brave. Like, it continues to be this sort of structural logic of the series. Even in The Cursed Child, right? It's like the bad Potter son who didn't inherit his father's bravery. Mm -hmm. And then this poor kid who people think is Voldemort's child. Like, it, it continues to be obsessed with the, like, possibility of inheritance. Which is why we keep coming back to this, like who's the next Voldemort going to be? Because this world, as it's designed, is going to keep producing Voldemorts. 100%. It's insidious. It's insidious, and it weaves through this whole series. But more on that in the appendix. The 
Thank you, witches, for joining us for another episode of Witch, Please. If you want to hang out with us some more, we're on Twitter and Instagram at a witch please. And we are also on Patreon at patreon.com slash a witch please. And recently Coach gave us the RSS feed that lets us <laughs> access the bonus content. So I've been listening to all of the blooper reels and I gotta say that they're really funny and you should probably go to our Patreon and get some of those bloops. Love a bloop. And you know what? Which Please is produced in partnership with Wilfrid Laurier University Press and distributed by Acast. You can find the rest of our episodes at ohwitchplease.ca along with transcripts. Yay! Special thanks as always to our team player of a producer, Hannah Rehack, aka Coach. <laughs> to our Witch Please apprentice, Zoe Mix. <laughs> And to our sound engineer, Eric Magnus. At the end of every episode, we shout out everyone who left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. So you've got to review us if you want to hear Marcel. Say it ain't so. What, it, what it song say is it, this? It's the song Say It Ain't So. <laughs> say it ain't so. I will no, not go. No, it's the... Keep the lights on. Carry me. Na, 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 I mean, na, that's na. pretty good. That's good. That's good. No, this is the Weezer song, Say It Ain't So. Oh, yeah. If you want to hear Marcel, Say It Ain't So. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, because my love is a heartbreaker. Okay, who's breaking our hearts this week? Macrina MM. Oh, Rosa. Nikki Pug. Aloya. And Live For It. Thank you all so much. We'll be back next episode to continue our discussion of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. But until then... Later, witches! <laughs>